Hello. Hello. Everyone should be able to hear me. How's it going, everybody? Tormented by gnomes here with a lore stream, hangout stream. Uh, basically, Pods had something that she had to do, and Matt was like, hey, could I have some more time to work on Curse of Tamrian? And I said, sure, I'll figure something out. <clears throat> Anyways, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I kind of vaguely have a plan for today, but until... Until 7.30, so in an hour and a half, uh, I'm just going to hang out with you folks. So uh, a few things we're going to do. First off, we are going to go ahead and just, this is an AMA. So feel free to ask me questions about anything. Casters and Castle stuff, other Casters and Castle stuff, cat stuff, whatever. You can go ahead and hit me with those now. Uh, second, we are doing a giveaway. Troll Lord Games gave us one code for... A copy, a hardcover copy of Amazing Adventures 5e. So, if you type exclamation point Xorbius with an X in chat, it'll make you eligible for that. And I'm going to give that away before we go live to Coriander Society. So, an hour and a half from now. Favorite color of cat? I don't have one because I love our tuxedo cat and I love our ginger cats and I love our... I don't know. I like all of them. Floofers slash Untramali, though, is a gorgeous tort. So, big fan of that. Do, do, do. do your cats find that one part of the carpet and puke on it at the most inconvenient times? We do not have carpet. But they do find any article of clothing that has been left on the floor, and they puke on that specifically. So, there's that. How am I doing? I'm tired today. I am I'm having, like, a really, really good day. I got a lot done at work. Uh, made Roll20 Ambassador, which is cool. That actually happened a while ago. Uh, I just hadn't, like, fully implemented it. So, that's cool. I've got thousands of hours on the platform, and I've been using it since 2012. So, I'm hyped about that. But yeah, I'm just zonked. Very tired. Did Zorbius exist before or after Morbius? Zorbius has been around since... Uh, like 2013, I want to say, which is when Matt and I started The Adventures of Carmichael, which, you know, ended up being the Coriander show. Uh, but the Morbius comic book character has been around longer than that. So before the movie, after the comic book character, I think. What do I get for being a Roll20 ambassador? So um, I get emails about... it's It's like a... It's not, it's not an affiliate thing where I get a percentage of sales. It's more like I'm asked to participate in hyping up stuff that's going on on Roll20, and in exchange, I get free stuff. Uh, I have some copies of the Roll20 version of the Tome of Heroes from Kobold Press that I'm going to give away. Not today, probably on a future stream. Uh, I, I picked up a copy of Strixhaven on roll 20 so now my my players can just drag silvery barbs over to their character sheets to completely with me so that's cool uh there's some other benefits as well mostly it's like i'm i'm in the loop but yeah free stuff it's neat and hopefully i'll be able to connect with other roll 20 ambassadors make more friends make more contacts all that stuff that is not the thing that i was hyped on twitter for that was voice mod uh i am trying to hook up casters and castles with a voice mod partnership or affiliate program like 20% return on anyone else who buys it. I've had so many people ask me about how I do all the different voices and soundboards and stuff that I figured, why not? <clears throat> Has Coriander gone in a direction you expected so far compared to the initial pitch? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say... I don't know. What did I originally pitch? I kind of just started with Angel Killer Miss Murders, which was a plot line left over from 2013 when I played that game with Matt. And we had to make a number of changes to the lore and to the backstory, because I, uh... You may have noticed... Yeah, Matt can chime in on this, too. You may have noticed I've dabbled. I like to dip from a lot of the same sources. 
a lot of my ideas are in common. You've got Mordain Vapor and Dream Magic all over the place. There was a lot more of that. And at the time, I did not want to complicate things with the uh, Coriander Society Anakra stuff. Anakra was still developing. I didn't want to cross the streams. I have since crossed the streams, but they used to be way more crossed. And it would have... What I don't want is for Coriander Society characters like John Carmichael and Asena to invalidate the drama of plot lines going on in Anakra. I don't want them to show up and kick a Shardalon's ass or save Eye off Academy or anything like that because that takes agency away from the characters of those campaigns. Uh, TLDR, yes and no. <laughs> We've established that John has been to Anakra, which means he arrived from the Hungry Dark. Correct. The Hungry Dark is just the universe, the multiverse, the omniverse outside of Anakra. So he's an invader from beyond the firmament. Yes. So this means John Carmichael is an infernal, right? No. The infernals were the most powerful fiends of a specific group of fiends that banded together from across multiple worlds and formed an expeditionary force to invade Anakra. The strongest members of those, that group and any fiends who have since risen to comparable power are called infernals. It's almost like a, like a title, but it only applies to fiends. It does not apply to everything from the Hungry Dark. For example, um, the One Flesh is not an infernal. I know it's not here yet in IOF Academy, but when it arrives, it still won't be an infernal. It's not a fiend. It's not a group of that fiend. A gnome with silvery barbs or pass without trace, which is more anti-me, pass without trace. Silvery barbs screws me on one check. Pass without trace screws all perception rolls for like an hour by plus 10. Mathematically, a advantage is it's basically worth plus five. So I guess on silvery barbs, there is a net plus 10 because it's disadvantage. So minus five on an enemy and then advantage. That's plus five for you. So it does net like a plus 10 total on the roll. But Pass Without Trace can give the whole party plus 10 on multiple stealth checks. So that one. How many free passes do the Derby Devils get with local authorities? Uh, Gorm is actually the one who's kind of going to be developing that to a certain degree. So I haven't established that yet. Would that make the Infernals alien invaders from outer space? Yes. I'm, I'm just going to say yes. What was my character in Curse of Tamarian? My character was a human witch who uses tea magic. The witch is a class from Mage Hand Press, and one of the things that witches have is a curse. All witches have a curse, which is funny because the curse just gives you benefits. It's a class feature that does nothing but help you. So the curse that I picked was Drowned, and that was my character. What do the underworld wellsprings look like? So the wellsprings are, if you think about the elemental planes in traditional D&D games, where it's just infinite expanses of fire, water, etc. The wellsprings are effectively conduits into that. So if the underworld primarily is, it looks like it's underground, because if you go deep enough in the ground in the mortal world, you will end up in the underworld. It is metaphysically inside the mortal world. And the wellsprings are very close to the very bottom of the underworld. So underground, deep underground, deep, 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 deep. Uh, <laughs> yes, Matt. So if you actually go down to the wellsprings, imagine a, for the wellspring of water, it's underwater because it's flooding. It's constantly flooding because it's just emanating out water. So there is a hole somewhere that looks like a hole in a cave somewhere that's just emanating water. So the closer you get to it, the more it's underwater. Uh, the, the elemental wellspring of fire, again, it's a hole in the ground, underground, that's just jetting out fire constantly. Almost like geysers. Do, do, do. The curses have flavor negatives, but mechanically are only good. Yes. Is this going to be saved as a VOD and added to lunch and lore as supper and lore? Probably. Coriander started with superhero comic books, went to sci-fi, space fantasy, anime, isekai. Where do you think Coriander will go next on its genre hopping adventures? So, one thing I would love to do with Coriander Society is visit worlds in partnership with their creators. So... 
if somebody's doing a Kickstarter for a new 5e setting or 5e port, I want to go visit their world and play with their toys. I would love to have one of the creators of that place involved in that pro in that project. Uh, there is a Weird West setting I've wanted to do for a while, but I don't really have an, a direct excuse to go there. There's a fantasy noir, almost like if you cross traditional D&D with um, Northport, that I want to visit. There's a deco-punk world I'm really excited to go to. We've actually already looked at the door to that. There is a science fantasy world. That's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I, there's a lot of opportunities, but really I kind of want to focus... Coriander Society has way too many plot threads right now. Just tons and tons of plot threads. So I want to focus on buttoning some of those up, and when we go to new worlds, primarily focus on crossovers or partnerships or sponsorships, because I would love I love the idea of somebody else who has their own world hosting John and Asena to go crash their world, and they get to show off what's cool about it, and John and Asena get to bring like all their, their guns and their otherworldly stuff into it. I, there's something about that idea that I just love. Are there any kinds of powers that are no-goes in Northport, or is it all bets are off? Nothing springs to mind, but try to keep it that 1930s golden age of superheroes, uh, cheesy, over-the-top, pulpy feel to it. More so than, like, modern superheroes. Do they look like actual springs? Yeah. No, they literally just look like springs. Now, if you go down into the springs, you end up in just the pure elements themselves. But they're, they're like geysers, physical, natural geysers, because they are natural... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's like consequences. Um, they arose naturally from the ordering of the world. It's not like the scribes chiseled out you know, special you know, pipes to funnel the elements in. Just the way Anakura was built, they're there. <clears throat> Reminder, we're giving away, at the end of this little impromptu hangout, we are giving away some, uh, a hardcover Amazing Adventures 5e, exclamation point, Zorbius in chat. But that also be incorporating their rule sets and such, as much as possible. So the, the weird thing about Anime 5e is that it has a lot of custom rules that I didn't get the chance to fully implement. I think it might have the thing Pathfinder has where if you exceed a target number by 10 or five or whatever, it's a crit and you can get a double crit, triple crit, stuff like that. Uh, the action economy works a little bit differently. There were some other rules that I just did not have the chance to fully implement. And if I ever run a Yokai Blossom one shot, which I want to with a bunch of Pokemon folks, uh, Pokemon broadcasters, if I ever get the chance to do that, I will try to cleave more closely to those rules. But yeah, whenever they visit another world, I want to try to incorporate as much of their rule sets as I can without mutating or changing John and Asena. Uh, Matt had an idea once where it was even more Kingdom Hearts-ish than it already is, where the, the, in Kingdom Hearts, when you go to the Toy Story world, you're a toy. And when you go to the pirate world, you're a pirate. You sort of take on the aspects or properties of that world. But I decided I didn't want to do that because I don't want to have to retool anybody's character sheets, basically. Weird West sounds like the spot my Deathless Gunslinger would be. Is that the right vibes? Yes. Absolutely yes. The setting has all the fantasy creatures that you're used to, uh, but the old world Europe analog is ruled by vampires. It's ruled by these aristocratic vampires who sort of rule openly over everybody else in eternal darkness. And then in the new world, you've got these desert frontiers and packs of ghouls like uh, holding up magic trains and prospectors and cattle rustlers and spell bullets and all that stuff. So, an un But an undead gunslinger still fits into Northport because it's multi-genre and they, they would work really well in like a cheesy 1930s style setting but they would fit in 100% deadly in uh, Weird West. When is the Helsing one-shot, and when do I get to play? Um, find somebody to DM it, and uh, that'll be good for it. Not that I don't want to, I'm just bogged, because that would be awesome. Are there recorded instances of an elemental changing its essence willingly or no from one element to another? 
I'm going to say no. There are no recorded instances of that. Has John ever mentioned how Krantaka was born? No, he has not. But I can give you a lowdown on that. Let me find the sauce. Here. I just posted in chat a link to a story called The Coming of Finn. It's, a, it's an Irish legend. There was a... In the castle of Tara, every year, this goblin fairy sorcerer would arrive and he would play on his magic harp and he would sing a song and put everyone to sleep. And then he would spit fireballs and burn the, the king's hall down until Finn shows up. And Finn's like, I will stay awake and I will kill this thing for you if you make me the captain of your men or something like that. Uh, he rolls up this young warrior and somebody gives him a magic spear made of bronze. And it's got like gold trim and it's covered in this wrap and all this stuff. And he says, if you put this spear to your forehead, it will burn you and it will keep you awake. So you'll be able to stop his spells. And Finn either received, it's in, it's in the thing I dropped, he either received or he already had a magic cloak. So when the sorcerer, Island shows up and plays his magic harp, everyone else falls asleep. But Finn puts the spearhead to his forehead and it burns and it keeps him awake. And then when the sorcerer spits fireballs, he catches them in his cloak. And the sorcerer runs, goes to the land beneath the hills. Uh, Finn chases him, cuts off his head, and becomes this great hero. So in the original Coriander Society campaign, uh, all of our heroes were from Earth. It was a lot more like shh, except with more of an emphasis on ancient mythology. Not you know, shh kind of has the same emphasis. So there were two people in Carmichael's group that adventure where they went underneath Boston and all that stuff he described, that was an actual adventure we played with actual characters. Uh, Matt was one of them, but there were others. And his character had a gun that was made from that spear. It was like that, that original Finn's spear was reforged into a bronze gun. So it still has the power to, he holds it up against his head for immunity to mind control and charm and things like that. And it has the warp spasm which was a berserk power attributed to the Irish hero Cúchulainn. I think that's pronounced roughly right. Uh, and that's why it kills demons, and that's why it kills fairies, because of all that mythology, all that old lore. Ghouls and mules, I love it. Uh, the unofficial name for that campaign is Perdition Flats. Follow-up to Elemental Question, is it theoretically possible in Anakra? Hold on. Okay, we have a cat cat containment breach. One sec. How much, okay. I think the only thing that I missed was the elemental conversion possible, no guarantees, don't know exactly how it would work. I think that's everything I said aside from yelling at cats. And I think I'm caught up now. Yeah, I think I'm caught up. Yes, Matt, go ahead. The one thing, actually, this is kind of bad because this VOD isn't going to have chat on it. Uh, European privacy laws, for some reason, make it so that it's a good idea to not have chat. I don't remember exactly what it is. So I'm just going to have to try to include questions in the VOD as best as possible. But yes, uh, Ninja Man Matt has a question, a real one. Go ahead.
And while he... Sword, Joe has notes. This is a note I have written down from Loot in Ashen. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. I hope I have that written down in my notes somewhere because otherwise I'm, I'm done. See if this works. Okay, this works. Do, do, do. You already have a cool pole axe, a cool uh, gun, a cool shield, a cool amulet. Who, who's, who's a cool sword for, Matt? Who's a cool sword for? When were we in Ashen? Feels like it's been ages. Yeah, so this is this is what my my campaign look, notes look like sometimes. By the way, this is the notes for the the fifteenth of March. That's that's all I wrote down. Because hopefully I've I've the way that my campaigns work is I try to have enough done with the setting and the area and the characters that I just know what's going to happen next, or I know yeah they're going to go to this dungeon and I already put the dungeon into roll twenty, so I don't have to worry about it. So sometimes my notes are, yeah, so here, here's my notes from, the, from May when they were going back to Northport and they were going to have a message from Mr. Lowe. And I just basically wrote some notes about the poetry he was going to send and some of the interaction that he was going to have. And I didn't write any more notes because the rest of the notes were I had the map done for Mr. Lowe's mansion. I had his notes in his character about who he is and his personality and his backstory. So my session notes are often just prepared maps and little scraps, bits and pieces. How many weird kryptonite-esque elements slash gems slash radioactive thingies slash whatever are there in Northport? So I don't have a clear answer to that because Northport is full of super science and weird science. So there's no telling how many of those things there are. There could be things from space. Uh, there could be things from inside the planet. Chrissy just got home from cat trapping. Just had to make sure she was okay. All right. What was Zorbius's greatest failure? Not killing John Carmichael and Asena when he had the chance. What's the science behind mutants in Northport? So mutants, uh, the gifted are not mutants, just to clarify that. The gifted are not mutants. There definitely could be mutations. They could be caused by uh, radiation. They could be caused by chemicals. They could be caused by exposure to alien artifacts. They could be caused by the thermodynamic reverse barometric uh, genetic recalibration combustulizer. You got to remember, the science is very soft. It's very soft. I'm, you know, I'm actually going to post a video that, uh, two videos that I think epitomize the feel of Northport. So let's do the mechanical monsters. Grammarly. And these are each like 10 minutes yet. All right, 10 minutes. These are 10 minutes each. And then. So these are comics from the 40s. Did Chrissy have a successful harvest out in the cat mines? I don't know. I haven't actually checked in with her. I just heard her come in and I heard her say something. Wanted to make sure she didn't need help. She was just grateful for the AC. Do, do, do. How much sand will it take to make that sword a saber able to bond with Chester? Chester, the saber cat. Uh, Matt, get a hobby. How much do we know exactly about the Coriander Society? So far, there hasn't been many details yet, right? So the Coriander Society exists in, er, on Earth primarily. They are transdimensional to a certain degree. They are responsible for 
protecting and preserving Earth's magical heritage. They are not a government agency. They are an ancient occult society. They have access to magical artifacts and magical teaching. They are like the MIB of magic on Earth. They date their origins at least back to ancient China, which is where they derived their name. In ancient times, the coriander flower was associated with different types of magic, eternal life, etc. So they at least trace their, their origins that far back. They are organized into different cells or teams, and each team does not have direct contact with other teams. They're siloed, so they don't know who else is in the society. Every team has a handler who is their contact with the rest of the society, gives them their missions. Each team is usually assigned to one city or one area, but sometimes you've got teams that are mobile because they specialize in like curses or uh, magical viruses or dragons. You know, they have a specialty, so they travel all around the world. Uh, they always have resources from the, the magical vaults of the society. They've got access to some amount of money. And they go around hunting vampires if the vampires are, like, not playing ball. You know what I mean? They're not necessarily going to exterminate vampires on Earth. But if the vampires are just killing people left and right, they're going to hunt them down. Uh, if if uh, some normie gets their hands on magic and starts using it for massive personal profit and exploitation, they're going to go get that. They're very much inspired by Warehouse 13, the librarians, things like that. What does Grammarly have to do with Northport? Nothing. I had a, uh, I had a thing with the stuff. Is the Earth hollow, according to Coriander Society? I don't believe so, but Northport Yord absolutely is. Like, I, I can confirm that. I don't know how much of that is character knowledge, but the world of Yord is absolutely hollow, and there are jungles and dinosaurs and things inside of it. Can confirm. Symbiotes. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities for alien life in Northport. Like, there absolutely could be symbiotes and different aliens. But the thing you gotta remember is because it's this 1930s sort of feel, and because everything is almost like Earth, but not quite, there are literally flying saucers and little green men style aliens. A lot of the aliens look like they would have looked like in 1930s comics, uh, War of the Worlds style stuff. Ray guns that have big like circles on them and Mars attacks, sort of all that stuff. Uh, but there's other planets out there. Like Yord is just one planet in this whole universe. And there absolutely could be other forms of alien life out there. But the spaceships are likely going to look like rocket ship toys. Not like, you know, super high-tech spaceships. They're going to look like flying saucers and backyard rockets and stuff like that. Let me see if I can find my uh, list of some of the planets in the solar system. Uh, Stillborn is the closest. It's not Mercury. Phosphorus, it's not Venus. Yord, it's not Earth. Mavors, it's not Mars. Uh, Jove, which is definitely not Jupiter. Phanon, which is definitely not Saturn, Cytus, Leviathan, and Psychopomp. And there are, there is absolutely life. There are Martians. They're not Martians. Briggsy's character in our one shot was a, not a Martian, but totally a Martian. But just, if you think about the absolute most cliched old school aliens, that's what the, the vibe is. What kind of resources would you have for making half demons, um, a person who goes murder happy because demon parent aggression? Off the top of my head, you could definitely do that in Anime 5e. And maybe some of the Monsters of the Blood War, or players, characters of the Blood War stuff from the DMs Guild, because that has rules for playing as an imp or a bearded devil or a variety of different demons and devils. But that specific rule, I can't immediately think of. Has there been any apocalyptic events on Yord so far? Superpowered folk and evil geniuses running around seems like it would have caused some kind of cataclysm so far. 
Uh, classically, there's a couple sunken civilizations that are definitely not Atlantis. Uh, but most of the time, apocalyptic events have been thwarted by two-fisted, square-jawed heroes just saving the day in the nick of time. Again, the world itself kind of follows the conventions of these cheesy old stories. A link to Anime 5e? Uh, let's see. There you go. Very fun system. Totally customizable. Do, do, do. When y'all travel after a long day of work, which side of the bed do you claim is your own at the hotel? I have mostly traveled alone. As far as I know. So, the right side. While waiting for more questions, I'm gonna just go through... That's another thing. I made Roll20 Ambassador, which is cool. Uh, but one thing that I want to do is to start providing some resources to help people use Roll20 better. So in addition to questions about Casters and Castles and Coriander Society, Anakra, IOF Academy, uh, all that stuff, I can also answer questions if you have any about Roll20. So I'll go through some tips and tricks while we're here. Is there anything I'm particularly excited for right now in Casters and Castles? Everything. <laughs> Everything. I'm, I'm having a ton of fun. Uh, I have a couple of one-shots that I'm producing. And after I produced a million one-shots the other month, that's kind of tiring. I've got some Streamloots cards I have commissioned, which is cool because I like giving money to artists. And I, I, I don't know, I like cards. I like collecting cards. Uh, I am super, super pleased with my cast in IOTH Academy. I'm just so lucky to have those folks. I'm excited for every single episode. For Coriander Society, we are doing a crossover with another show soon, and I'm really stoked for that. Uh, and I want to do more of those. I definitely want to do more of those because I think they're neat. Favorite underrated mythology, purely your own biases as to what it constitutes. Underrated. I'd say uh, Celtic Irish, but that's honestly got a really big following. Underrated mythology. Hmm. Maybe Sumerian, ancient Sumerian, Gilgamesh, Enkidu, all that. With Coriander going to so many worlds slash maps, how do you keep it organized? Do you have separate lobbies for different worlds, or is everything jumbled together? It's one campaign. It's just one big campaign. Uh, stand by for, for leaks. <laughs> so I have folders for my heroes. This is all in the journal tab, by the way, uh, which I might need to shrink a little bit so it's more visible. Oh, no, it's just cropped out. Okay, so when you're in du dungeon master mode, you've got more options on this sidebar. So I'm in the journal tab, uh, and I can create all these different um, subfolders to keep things organized. So I've got heroes, which is our main characters, and then allies and minions. So you've got like Slakura and Samuel and Zarzix, and when they were fighting with the Marlurks, I have that in here. Uh, hero notes, bases and hideouts, because I have the special rules for everyone's bases and such. Here's Orvi and Jisha from Yokai Blossom, because we had some guest players. Then under worlds, I've got. Uh, my different worlds, this is where like my lore lives, right? So if I expand Northport, you can see that I've got articles for the different parts of, let's see, click on Yord. These are behind the, the scenes notes. This is no longer unknown. Uh, but all these ones, the dot means, oh, you can't see the dot. All these are accessible, so I can, I can click this and read on it. I don't, I'm not gonna show my secret notes. Uh, and then I've got my notes for Dragoon. And then I've got my notes for Pyre Space with all the different planets. Then as for maps, the way I have it is all these are different maps. I know this is covered by, North, by the big Northport thing. This is just the map of Northport. So I've got my tokens for different worlds. And then I've got uh, like a couple of key settings. And then all these are organized as NP for Northport, even though the world is Yord. And so I've got all these different maps here. And then I've got like a, a breaker here to sort of separate out into some other stuff. 
Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry about any of this. Do do do. And then other worlds. I just include a blank map here to break it up. So worlds that they might need to go to. Here's some places in the Obsidian Tower. Here's uh, Astral Transit whenever they go visit Rocco. And then I have the rest of these all archived. So this, these are my Dragoon places. And these are my Pyre Space places. So I keep them archived so I don't have to look at them when I'm dealing with everything else. I'd like to hear more about the Ruin That Walks. I feel like it's one of the Infernals we've heard the least about. Yes, so the Ruin That Walks is a chaotic Infernal, but that's kind of hard to say because the Ruin That Walks is the Infernal of Groupthink, Mobthink, where uh, inspiring people to violence, whenever you people get sort of swept up into hating somebody or fearing somebody or attacking somebody. Tillebeck is a patron of swarms of locusts and hordes that just sort of get lose their individual identity and get swept up in a fervor of violence with others. Tillebeck's followers are the Raveners, and the Raveners are a lot like the Gorham Reavers from Firefly. They just rampage across the land, and when they show up, either they kill you you escape from them, or you become one of them. And if you join them in the bloodshed and raiding, then they don't kill you. Or at least they don't deliberately kill you. Sometimes they turn on their own, but unlike a lot of chaotic hordes, because they're all sort of caught up in this frenzy, it's not like these two are going to get in a fight. It's more like if there's a disagreement, someone's going to get injured, and then everyone else is going to peck them to death. So Tillebeck encourages mob violence. Tillebeck encourages um, suspicion and persecution and all those sorts of things. So the Raveners, where have the Raveners shown up? The Raveners attacked Ioth Academy in year four, I think. That was one of those roving bands. The Ruin that walks appears as... it. Tillebeck is almost this disembodied spirit that takes over swarms of things. So might inhabit a gigantic cloud of locusts um, or a fire burning across the land and just emerges as this titanic figure in that shape, guiding its will towards increased uh, violence. Got any tips and tricks for managing a campaign that size? Does it ever lag or take a long time to load? Yes, it does. Keep your file sizes small. Uh, one thing that I, I will do is I will reduce the, let me see if I can get an example. I won't be able to exactly get an example, but I use a free software called paint.net, which looks like a virus. It is not a virus. <laughs> uh, it's a decent Photoshop alternative. It doesn't do everything that Photoshop does, but it does a lot of things. And the, the website where you get it, at the, it looks like a virus. It 100% looks like a virus. It's getpaint.net. But uh, it's good if you don't have Photoshop. When you're saving a file, always save it as a JPEG if it doesn't need any transparency, especially your maps and your big scenes. Always save it as a, as a JPEG and try to reduce the quality because when you go from quality like 100 to 99, those few top percentage points knock huge amounts of, off the file size. And the smaller those files are, the better they'll load. So try editing those, take out as much quality as you can before you really start noticing it, before you upload it. That will help with your load time. Do, do, do. What else? What are the differences between the Raveners and the Hunt? The Raveners are roving band. They do have that in common with the Wild Hunt, but the Wild Hunts, so Ravener is uh, taxonomy of these two. Wild hunts are fey. Raveners are associated with Tillebeck, the infernal. Wild hunts are mostly cons mostly comprised of fey. Mortals can get swept up in the hunt, but they originate as groups of fey riding across the land. The vast majority of Raveners are mortals, with a few fiends at the heart of it, but they're mostly mortals who have joined. 
The wild hunt is a spirit. It's a natural, it's a part of nature because it is about predation and uh, hunting and predators and carnivores. It's, it's a manifestation of that inherently violent, red of tooth and claw aspect of nature. The Raveners are a manifestation of societies and civilization. As uncivilized as they may seem, that sort of group think they're not going after people because like, oh, it's a hunt. Let's chase the most dangerous prey. They're going after people because they're different or because they think they're weak or something along those lines. So it is a force that's derived from the shadow side of civilization rather than being a embodiment of a primal force. Uh, there are lots of different different Ravener bands, but because Tillebeck is the inspiration for all of them, when they encounter each other, there's usually some violence, but they often merge after that. They decide a few members, they have to have some sort of conflict, they have to have some sort of violence, but they also want to form into one large group, one large mob. So they usually uh, pick out a few people in each group who they suddenly decide are wrong or inferior or unworthy or degenerate or something like that and they use those people as scapegoats and then they merge the hunts tend to be a lot smaller a ravener band could be thousands of warriors but a hunt tends to be much much smaller because every hunt has its own lord of the hunt it might be a few dozen or a few score but your individual members of a wild hunt are also going to be stronger because they're these fey creatures instead of just somebody who was caught in the fields when the raveners came and decided to join them and has very little combat training. So that's some of the difference. Do, do, do. Are all the Titan children of Sin minus Zalar human appearing? Uh, let me pull up the table of Titans. Do, 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 do. And I'll post a link to this article. In, whoops. Oh, some guy, all your stuff got deleted. Uh, I will fix that in a moment for you. I can permit you and I can give you status as a regular so you'll have permission to post links. Okay, the Table of Titans. Let's go through Sin's children. Faruk has a humanoid appearance or can appear as humanoid. Mies. Nice is a very enigmatic titan who tends to take on a purely elemental form, but can appear as a uh, humanoid. Sirocco can appear as a burning wind, like literally a wind, a fiery wind, but also has a humanoid guise. In fact, fun fact, Zalar has a humanoid guise as well, but usually appears in the form of the phoenix. And then if we go the other way, Aruk has a humanoid guys. We already talked about Nice, and there's Zalar. So I hope that answers for you. A lot of the Titans have multiple forms and can take on a guise if they need to speak to somebody or, or send their message to somebody. Do. <clears throat> Don't forget to get in on the giveaway! Exclamation point Zorbius with an X. The Raveners are more like a chaotic version of Stone Abbey. Yes, absolutely. That is a good way to put it. And yeah, Anime 5e is so fun. It's completely customizable. You can build your characters from the ground up. I, it's a blast. Great, great system. There's a world where we based uh, Coriander Society off of that instead to make it more um, modular. Uh, but I'm very happy with Amazing Adventures. I wanted us to be based in this world. I feel like it was a great jumping off point. What's the backstory of the Charnel Hound? The Charnel Hound. So, I was going to do something. I was going to make it so some guy does not get uh, schlapped for posting links. I'll have to do that later because if I, I, I could mess up the giveaway otherwise. All right, the Charnel Hound. The Charnel Hound is a guardian creature that was created by Ramius, the who in Ioth Academy's time is the cupbearer of the gods, was the cupbearer of the gods. So each, when you look at the Titans, there are four Titans, technically seven actually, that are the sole 
offspring or creations of one sovereign. So Ramius is only the creation of Arakura. No other sovereigns were involved in the creation of Ramius. And Ramius is power over life. Uh, the, the life blood that, you know, is sort of this manifestation of vital energy that derives from the earth. Ramius will go on eventually to become the cupbearer, to no longer be the cupbearer of gods, and instead become the stern lord, the overlord of the dead. And when that happens, he changes the way the underworld works, and he changes the way that death works. And because all the Infernals become... This is spoilers for Ioth Academy, by the way. It's not spoilers for Quest of the Book of Dawn. This is spoilers for Ioth Academy, because this hasn't happened yet, as of Ioth Academy. So, Romulus changes the Emerald Tablets. He changes the way that death works. He changes the laws of physics so that all, in, all fiends are trapped in the underworld. They, there are ways for them to escape, but by default, they can't leave the underworld, and if they were somewhere else, they get forcibly dragged, squeezed through the earth. Their spirits get, like, pulled. Their, their physical forms get ground into nothing as they're crushed into the earth. Their essences arrive in the underworld and recomposite themselves. He builds the Kingdom of Shadows, which is surrounded by these enormous marble cave walls. He has the adamant gates blocking the door, and he has the Charnel Hound at its gate. And the Charnel Hound has a few jobs. Uh, it is there to stop the living from entering the kingdom of death. That is its primary objective. Uh, it's also supposed to sniff out fiends and any fiends that are trying to get in. Um, but yeah, it's his guard dog. And Ramius created it from the corpses of the dead. And one of the fates that might happen to a soul that deserts his army is being incorporated into the Charnel Hound because it's sort of this amalgamation of souls and uh, spiritual energy. And it absorbs bodies. And when it absorbs a body, it can absorb the vital energy of that body as well. So a fragment of that person becomes part of its consciousness. Except that it's overwritten by its nature and by its orders from Ramius to guard the adamant gates. It's his watchdog. Have you heard about the new Cat Game Stray? Yes, the Cat Game Stray has been all over the internet all day today. Uh, I doubt I am going to play it only because I don't have a lot of time. It's self-inflicted. It's not like, oh, I'm so busy. Oh. It, it's 100% it's self-inflicted. Um, I got stuff to do. I got Project Syllabus stuff to do. Uh, I'm chasing a bunch of sponsorships. I got to do the day-to-day -day of just, you know, uploading VODs and running the channel. All that stuff. So when I do play Vidya, I mostly just play Squad. Because I can hop on. Play one round, play two rounds, and then go to bed. Or whatever. So yeah, I haven't played... I don't get the chance... I don't choose to play video games nearly as much as I used to. So, one thing I want to go over... Is... A neat little feature in Roll20. And I'm going to use John Carmichael as my example here. So here is John Carmichael's spell list, right? If you didn't know this, if you were not aware of this, you can click this, the I icon. And again, I apologize the way that I have this cropped. One of the symbols at the top in the right-hand side of Roll20 is the compendium. It's a little letter I as in indigo in a circle. And you can use that to search for all sorts of stuff. Now, this is where owning Roll20 stuff comes in handy because by default, everything that's in the 5th edition SRD, which is like the free stuff, is in here. So Fireball and a lot of other spells, a lot of items. But if it's a spell from a specialty book or if it's a spell from the player's handbook and you don't own that digitally on Roll20, uh, then it won't show up. But I'm just going to go ahead and click this compendium and then click, let's say I want to add, he already has disintegrate. Let, let me say I want to add teleport to a spell list. I can just click the search bar and type teleport. I have this teleport spell here. I click it, I drag it, and now it's on his character sheet. I don't have to manually enter all the details of the spell. And if he clicks the spell, it's just going to go. It's just going to drop into chat. Nice and easy. 
wrong button entirely. But yeah, here it is. So it dropped the spell in there. This is really handy. You can do the same thing with items. Sorry, John, you don't have that spell yet. I'm gonna click the lock and then click the delete icon and then relock it. So if you go to the core page and we go to items, sword, Joe has notes. I only hope so. Anybody who's making characters for Curse of Tamrian, if you're not making your character in D&D Beyond, if you're using Roll20, this is, this is your lifeblood. This is super, super, super helpful. Uh, but let's say I want, does he have a backpack? There's a lot of stuff on here, but I don't think I see a backpack. Backpack. So I search item, backpack, drag it, drop it. Bam, backpack deployed. Let's say he wants to equip a battle axe. Here's all of his attacks, right? I grab battle axe, drag it, drop it. And here it is. And if it already has all the stats programmed in, so it knows to use his proficiency modifier and his strength modifier. And if I click it, it's gonna roll. It might take, yeah, there we go. Oh, natural 20, I wasted one of John's 20s, excellent. So this is super, super handy if you're using Roll20 for your character sheets. Uh, can we import from D&D Beyond? I don't recommend it because there is a better option, in my opinion. Let me find this for you. I will also drop this in chat. There is a browser extension called Beyond20. And it is... Super, super, hold on, I have to farm clout. One sec, come here. This is, I think this is Turnip, one of our fosters that we have right now. Yeah, so if you install the Beyond 20 extension, this is what we did for book, Quest for the Book of Dawn. You can make your character in d d Beyond, and this extension adds buttons that will let you roll from d d Beyond into Roll20. Let me see if I can hook up an example real quick. Because I have this installed myself. Uh, characters. Okay. Level 20 ultimate version of Tiberius Wanderstave when he was in ultra mode for exactly one round before he exploded. I have beyond, the Beyond 20 uh, extension installed. So whenever I mouse over these, you see this Beyond icon pops up. And then if I click Firebolt, it rolls here. You can see the, I rolled a 19 here. And hey, what do you know? It automatically went into Roll20 as well. And there's a Beyond 20 button up here that I can click. So I want to do normal roll, use the digital dice. Uh, da, 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 yep, 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 cool. So this is where you can configure your, your like whisper advantage, etc. cetera. Uh, if I want to make a deception check, got a 30. And it says one roll sent to virtual tabletop. It made it, it migrated automatically into roll 20. So this is really, really big if you have a digital library of stuff in D&D Beyond. Or if your friends, if you're part of somebody else's campaign in D&D Beyond, you can keep all your character stuff there. What I would recommend that you do though, is make sure that your dungeon master has a link to your character. Because your dungeon master needs to be able to vet, oh my goodness, hello. Hello. Oh, we're being cuddly now. You wanna, you wanna come up and say hello? Hello. I don't know if you can hear this purr. I don't know if you can hear this purr, but. We're being cuddly now, huh? So yeah, make sure that your dungeon master has a link to your D&D uh, &D Beyond character so that they can vet your stats, all that stuff. It's really handy for me when I'm using Roll20 to be able to pull up the party's stats as needed. So just uh, do that courtesy. 
I had another question in the chat earlier. Oh, someone's getting jealous. Winter Mjoller is here. Do you have a personal favorite player moment that you remember? I mean, I can easily say um, Bren summoning a Shardalon. Like, that was enormous. That was a great moment. Hello. Hello. Okay, there we go. That was fantastic. Um, okay, so I actually have an Act of God story that predates Acts of God. Reminder, by the way, if you haven't entered it, you can do exclamation point Zorbius in chat. Where is it? Uh, giveaway. If you do exclamation point Zorbius in chat, in about half an hour, I'm going to give away a hardcover copy of Amazing Adventures 5e by Troll Lord Games. So be sure to do that and stick around for the drawing. When I lived up in the mountains, we did not have air conditioning. And in the summer, it got very hot. So we had an elaborate, uh, or was this when we lived it down? Anyways, we had this elaborate system of what windows were open during what time of day to maximize our climate conditioning. I was living in the house, I was playing D&D or playing video game or Warcraft 3 with my friends and mom asked me to open up the, the windows or close the windows, close the windows. And I forgot. ADHD do be like that. So I forgot. And instead of scolding me or yelling at me or taking away my privileges or whatever, she got on her computer and made coupons that were good for one automatic saving throw. And then for every window that I left open, she gave my players one of these cards. Which is hilarious. It was a, it was a great solve, a very good-spirited solve. Years go by. Literal years go by. I think we're in college now, or I've like started... Uh, that was in high school, now I'm in college. I'm starting college. And I'm playing... Was it... Age of War? No, it wasn't Age of Worms. It was a war campaign. I was using Heroes of Battle. I used to play with my cousins, Slug Slayer and all the rest of my cousins. And we went up to a different set of mountains, uh, Idlewild in Southern California. All the, all the cousins went up together and to the cabin and we just played Halo on Halo 2 on Xbox and uh, Mario Kart and D&D for the whole weekend. That's like we would go up into the beautiful nature of the mountains Take, and every day we'd go out for outside for five minutes to make sure our skin didn't rot. And we spent the rest of the time inside playing D and D. They go down into the underdark and they are dying. This is the first. It's like only a second or third time anyone has ever died. Half the party is dead. They got their asses handed to them by a war troll. And there's spellcasters and mind flayers hitting them with stuff. And Nick Slug Slayer has gotten very, very quiet. For a while. And I'm like, what are you, what are you up to? What, what's going on? And he's just sitting there thinking to himself. And finally, he shakes his head. He opens his wallet. And inside is this wrinkled, like, desiccated coupon for one free automatic saving throw that he had saved for years. So he, he pulled it out on me. And I had forgotten they exist. Because it had been three or four years. Uh, it absolutely wrecked me. It, it was one of those moments where I just had to sit there contemplating my own existence. So that was absolutely a great moment. What is one of my favorite parts of Anachron lore? Who are you looking for, dear? Uh, I don't think she's in here. I have Turnip and I have... Um, what's the other one? It's not Pumpkin or Squash. Yeah. Uh, favorite part of Anachron lore. I have a soft spot for Zaylar. Because Zaylar was the first deity I ever invented. 20 plus years ago. When I just started playing D&D. I had my first character. He was uh, a cleric from the back of one of the AD&D 1st or 2nd edition modules. Pre-made character. Nestor the Pious. And at first I didn't really know what his deity was. Because uh, the DM wasn't really doing more focus on just running the dungeon, right? Very old school style. 
But I started thinking and I started world building and I wanted to make my own deity. And Zalar was the first one that I came up with. And he's been a Phoenix God for long before he was one of the Titans. He was this Phoenix God outside of Anakra lore. You got to remember, Anakra is just me taking all the bits and pieces I've done across the, my career as a DM and squishing them all together. So I have a soft spot for Zalar, first deity I ever created. I have a soft spot for Despair's Herald because uh, the Herald was a character, a villain, who I portrayed on a role-playing, text-based role-playing site, Legend of the Green Dragon, along with a few people who are in this community. Uh, he was my villainous character, and uh, I, just, I just loved playing him. A lot of the aspects of his lore were invented back then in 2005, 2006. Uh, and I've spent more time inside the Herald's head than a lot of others. Uh, I have a lot of stories from, from back in the day, that version of the Herald, that were uh, formative for me. So that's another one of my favorite parts. Have I ever made Matt cry in a campaign? Was it tears of joy or sorrow? Uh, yeah, I, I th think yes. I think yes. I'm catching up with chat, by the way. I haven't looked down the line for a bit. Ow! Ow! Oh my god! Oh my god! Ah, those little claws! Oh, it hurts! It hurts! My leg is not for climbing. Only when I'm wearing jeans, little one. Sweet, hideous pain. Hello. Uh, where was I? Have I ever made Matt cry? Uh, I believe so. I believe so. Um... It's a story that gives away some very proto versions of uh, Anachron lore. Let me just say that Sin has been around for a long time as well and was not always an elemental sovereign uh, and has a son who there was a campaign I played with Matt. <laughs> You're going to learn how much of this stuff I'm just harvesting from different places. So, Senapulker in Coriander Society, right? And the five villains who came from that world, all player characters. Player characters from a campaign uh, that was supposed to be a one-shot, and everyone died. And Matt's character ran into the tomb and said, please just bring back my friends, I'll give you my soul. And instead of it ending as a one-shot, it be turned into an evil undead campaign. So, Dre Dodson and uh, Caster the Undead Gunslinger and General Sagomo, and the Dry Man Reaver, who we haven't really met yet, and Lawrence Booker Green was my NPC character. All those people were player characters in this evil campaign working for Santa Polker. Um. Anyways, I made Matt cry in a, in a campaign that we started because we couldn't get that group together. Scheduling issues. So I started a much smaller game with Matt and his brother. And I said, this is just going to be a anything goes campaign. It's our, our tagline for that campaign. Fuck it. This is anime. It was anime inspired. It was going to be over the top. It was going to be overpowered. It didn't really like we could do whatever we wanted. And it started out uh, Irlek, which is in this world across the seas from IOF Academy on the western side of continents. Uh, Irlek is. I invented it for that campaign. It was where our heroes began their journey. Uh, anyways, his character in that found out about his mother and father from a important mentor character, and in the course of discovering the truth of that, I believe mainly tears were shed. Audio, de is the audio desynced? Okay, cool. Uh, I just caught up. Yeah, I, I just caught up. Just caught up with chat. Am I sufficiently moisturized? No. Little one, don't type. Why are you being so cuddly? You're not normally this cuddly. Hi. So I have um, another thing that I wanted to show on Roll20. Again, feel free to keep the questions coming. We've got about 20 more minutes. 20 more minutes of this, I think. All right. Don't, uh, don't worry about those monsters in the journal at all. 
So one thing I want to go over for Dungeon Masters is putting maps into Roll20 because there's kind of an art to it. I get most of my maps from Patreons that I'm signed up for and from Drive Through RPG because it's not always easy to convert a print map or some other format of map for hello, hello, for virtual tabletop. Because for virtual tabletop, you want a map that's going to line up really nicely with your grid and isn't going to have any borders along the side, no margins or anything like that. I. Okay. Okay, it, it's, time for, it's time for me to be groomed. My fuzz needs to be groomed. <laughs> Just looking in the back of my head. Okay. So anyways, I buy maps in packs or from Patreon that are specifically made for virtual tabletop because they line up nicely and I can talk more about where to get maps and where to source maps later. And of course, you can make your own. Uh, if you're doing personal use only, then there's a lot of free maps out there. But I tend to use maps that I've purchased because I want to make sure I have the rights for them. And also giving uh, money to artists is neat. Hello. Are you done with that side of my head? No, that's okay. Hi. Hello. Uh, where was I? Do, if we have Tamrian related lore questions, should we pester Matt or you? Ask Matt in the Discord. Uh, but. Matt is the one who's spent the most of his time like developing the lands, the cultures, the geography of Tamarian. So he's going to be way better equipped to answer those questions. If it's more of a large scale mythology question that, that just happens to affect. Hold on. Chrissy was looking for a cat and I think I found the cat. And I think that cat now has visitors. <clears throat> Anyways, ask Matt if it's very specific to the region. Ask me if it's more generic, but we both see questions that you put into that chat channel. So Ishtar is sort of being forced to exist by you using that subclass for Curse of Tamrian. One of the things I like to do is if there's a subclass that refers to lore that doesn't really work in an Akra, uh, my first choice is always to reskin it or to modify it as needed. But you have to remember, an Akra exists amongst all the other universes. It's sealed off from them, but those universes still exist. So the god Paylor, uh, Faerun, Lolf, all those things exist somewhere. They just don't live here, and so they're mostly unknown here. It leaves the door for characters who need to tap into that stuff to exist here. For the most part, I try to, like, whenever I'm writing official lore, aside from a Shardalon, I don't really include those things at all. But I want to leave the door open for characters to be able to use them. So, like, Asmodeus, uh, Orcus, the Demon Princes... They exist, but they're not here. Do I know the names of the rest of the dragons in the gates of the Silent City? I have them written down somewhere. Yes, I have them written down. Uh, because the Silent City is another thing that came from the same campaign where Irelek came from. A lot of that, that campaign's lore ended up being fundamental, fundamental to an Akra. So I do have those written down. Are binders poking through the cracks of an Akra? Yeah, a lot of the times they're messing with a firmament. Little bits of power leaking through the firmament. When did the firmament battles start and who is it with? So the firmament, when it was originally created, was almost completely sealed 
So there were no attackers. There were no battles. There was nothing of the sort. Then Uzul kills Arakura, and the death of a sovereign causes the firmament to crack because they're the ones who made it. Now, there aren't battles happening yet, but technically, Vindor should be the one protecting that area. He's not responsible for the, um, for the firmament, but he is the first line of defense because the Sky Kingdom is like the outer layer of Anakra aside from the firmament. That is one of the reasons why he started conquering the crap out of the Aurai and the Arakokra and the giants when Arakura died. Partially, it was uh, out of paranoia because, oh my god, we can die. I don't want to die. I'm going to take totalitarian control of everything and stop anything that could be a threat to me by having total control. But also, I'm going to draft everyone into my armies so that if something comes through the gap, we can fight it. <clears throat> that being said, nothing was really lurking near the outside of Anakra because the firmament not only kept things out, but it prevented like light and magic and all that stuff from leaking out. So it was almost imperceptible from the outside. There's no reason for anyone to go anywhere near it. So there haven't really been any major battles. The major battles start after the One Flesh enters Anakra, squeezes its way through the firmament. Uh, at that point, Railta creates the Celestials, puts the stars up in the sky, and that's where battles start to happen along the firmament because you've got these patrols watching the gaps, watching the cracks. What sort of stuff could be out there? Uh, astral dreadnoughts, dead gods, fiends, wandering fiends, just like the Infernals were, a fiend that's just scouring or an army that, of fiends, like if a demon prince. So the origins of a lot of the Infernals are lost to time, but many of them could have been demon princes and arch devils and similar creatures from other worlds who lost or were deposed. Like if you imagine that uh, Demogorgon or Orcus was defeated and had to flee the abyss and like had to flee that universe entirely into the hungry dark just taking whatever followers you could with you and leaving your universe behind entirely you're going to wander through the hungry dark and look for a new place to set up shop you need souls you need violence you need whatever it is you need to feed uh some of the infernals may have been deposed disgraced or ambitious demon lords and arch devils so you get that, uh, you get weird aberrations floating around out there, you get Githyanki pirates, a lot of stuff you'd see in the astral plane or even further beyond is what you would encounter along the boundaries. It's not like the firmament is a constant, enormous battlefield, it's more like a, a watchful barrier with occasional really challenging battles, because if something can make it all the way through the hungry dark, it's usually like an army or a, a leviathan of some kind. So whenever you see uh, shooting stars, after the, after the Court of Stars exists, it's either a messenger descending to talk to somebody, uh, a star deserting, like, uh, like Mitch's Uber's father did, or a star that died in combat against some terrible threat. What is the lore of gem dragons in Anakra? So all Anakran dragons were created by the Sovereigns and the Titans after they saw the dragons of the Seven Gates. You know, the Laughing God threw open the doors of the Silent City. The Seven Dragons of the Silent City emerged and were so strong that they wrecked the Infernals, just blew them apart. And the Sovereign said, damn, I gotta get me one of those. So they made all the chromatic all the metallic, and all the gem dragons. I want to say that gem dragons have a special connection to Nis, who is the sovereign, the titan of pure fire, and Drikla, who I think is the sovereign of, yeah, the sovereign of pure water. Because both of those titans are associated with inner flame, inner peace, psionic powers, reflection, secrets that lie within, that sort of stuff. Do, and I think I've caught up. We've got about 10 more minutes. I gotta see if my cast has pinged me at all. All 
All right, cool. Communicating with the cast. Do the gem dragons have tribes or their own thing going on? So when I made the original lore of the dragon tribes of Ocarthal, I didn't incorporate the gem dragons into it. They were there. I knew they were there. And I knew that there are more types of true dragons than the chromatic and the metallic. But I just wanted to go with that 10. Uh, off the top of my head, I believe that if there are tribes dedicated to the gem dragons, they're not tribes. Because you got to remember, the tribes of Ocarthal are huge. Uh, some of the inspiration comes from the 12 tribes of Israel, but you got to think of entire nations, like massive nations occupying huge amounts of territory for each of these. Each tribe is, is huge. So I think that I'm going to say that there are, it's more like secretive orders, small enclaves dedicated to the gem dragons that probably dwell within the lands of Ocarthal where the, uh, where the dragon tribes live, but they're they're very secretive. They train in psionic arts. They don't reveal their identities to others, uh, and they're lurking around out there somewhere. Don't going for a TKP tonight? Probably not. My party's pretty strong, and the fight that they're in right now is big and dramatic. But it's against a bunch of mooks, so I doubt we're gonna have a TKP. Uh, probably not until we uh, encounter one of the elder evils. Honestly, that's gonna be the best opportunity for it. What's the time you got a one up on Matt? Hmm. Most of the time when I get one up on Matt, it is by dropping a huge plot twist on him. Because the campaign that inspired Coriander Society started out uh, years ago and Matt played through it and uh, pods did not. One of the things I try to do is Matt and I try not to have too many inside jokes or references because it is not fair to pods to be an outsider out of the know too much. So when there are references and things like that that only Matt and I would understand, oftentimes we just let those slide. I'll just mention some detail uh, and Matt will like maybe make a face, maybe sort of, you know, uh, do a little something, something, but won't necessarily say anything. But most of the time when I get one over Matt, you can tell because he goes, God damn it. And his, his head explodes. And it's usually when I reveal something that I've been hiding for a long time. I do have the blood of court card. Uh, I already know how I'm going to use it. And, uh, we're going to find out very soon because there's lava coming over the sunken circle of Tlaikalel, which is where he buried the flesh of Kur in this world. I think that's the only piece of the flesh of Kur on the planet Yord, is in the sunken circle of Tlaikalel. One of the themes that I have going on in Yord is, uh, it's not Earth, but it's kind of hard to recreate the flavor of Earth without recreating the same... The same things that happened on Earth, uh, the colonialism, the violence, all that stuff. Like so many of the, the tropes that we associate with the 1930s, the golden age of comics arose from that because of all these things that happened. So uh, it's definitely an alternate history. And I try to make uh, choices that are, if not less violent, less oppressive for the history where possible. And one of the things I keep running into is revolutions overthrowing cruel monarchs. You've got that in Kemet, which is like an Egypt analog in, on Yord, where the last pharaoh was overthrown by a revolution and they implemented their own democracy. And something similar happened in Zolquia. So Zolquia is largely inspired by Central and to a certain degree South America, but mostly Central America. Uh, but it never got colonized. It never got invaded by a Spain archetype. So instead, those people eventually, they were ruled by a powerful, uh, if, if you're thinking of Mesoamerican, Mayan, Aztec sort of themes and mythology, that's what was going on there. And they were ruled by some cruel, by some cruel monarchs who were practicing human sacrifice and all that stuff. 
But uh, instead of the conquistadors coming in and conquistadoring the crap out of everybody, the tribes, the various tribes overthrew Tlaikalel, who was the last king of Zolquia, and established the Federated Tribes of Zolquia, their own government, their own autonomous, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sovereign government. So there are two different like pyramid structures. There are two different pyramids where people, uh, very evil kings, did very evil things. And in one of those, John bound the spirit of Tlaikalel, the last king of Zolquia, to a piece of the flesh of Kur as its guardian. Archerokodex coming back uh, in Curse of Tamrian. In Curse of Tamrian, there is a product. I, I will link it actually. Let me reminder reminder link the. Roka critical hit deck. I believe Drop the Die is the one who made that supplement. And it basically, every it's a supplement where every time you score a critical hit, instead of doing double damage, you can draw one of these cards and has some cool power up or effect. So in Curse of Tamrian, those are available. Have you ever made a big decision as a DM that I later regretted during a game? I can tell you offhand, yes, like a hundred percent yes, but I don't remember at the moment because I am usually spending so much of my mental energy improvising or trying to figure out how do I move forward from this? How do I like, yes, and this, how do I handle this act of God and this wild out of nowhere player decision and put them together and, and go forward? Um, so I'm trying to think of you know okay i'll give the one that matt always bugs me about i'll give the one matt always bugs me about which is i was playing a one shot from dungeon magazine which involved a, a fantasy mecha giant robot you know giant golem robot and it was just a one shot i was running this this canned adventure and matt wanted to interrogate he captured somebody and he wanted to interrogate that person and this was years ago when i was a worse dm <clears throat> And I sort of panicked, and instead of rolling with it and coming up with something on the fly like I would do now, when Matt punched the guy to knock him out and rolled a natural 20, I said, you killed him. That blow was so strong that you killed him. And he was playing a monk. Uh, and he still gives me crap about that to this day, which is, is fair, because a, 20, a natural 20 shouldn't punish the character, and a mid-level monk should be a master of the martial arts and be able to control their own force. So I should have gone along with what he wanted to do instead of punishing him for a critical hit and bailing myself out of improv that I wasn't prepared to do. So I definitely regret that. I think a lot of my decisions of regret have to do with um, table stuff rather than story stuff. Like, there's another campaign that... Uh, is actually the campaign that birthed Anakra. It was the campaign where I sort of turned this world that I was, a new world I'd created into Anakra by combining everything else. It was the first official game run in Anakra. It ran from 2016 to 2018, I want to say. Anyways, I wanted to start a new game. It was going to be this dark fairy tale game. And I invited 10 people because I figured we're all grown-ups with interesting lives. So that should get us somewhere around six people. Uh, instead, I ended up with nine players at my table. And I regret that. It, that did not go well. Another time in the campaign where Irelek came from, at an incredibly emotionally dramatic point where Matt was going to confront, he had been captured by his father, who was one of the main villains of the campaign, and it was very emotional, and his character's lover was gathering all their allies to stage this huge attack to rescue him. Uh, I invited some of our friends who weren't part of the campaign to play. And they brought in these characters that were just absolutely not... Uh, they didn't match the genre. There was like a chibi vampire, uh, which is fine for some campaigns. This was not the campaign for it. And one person threw a sandwich, like in the middle of this big confrontation when they freed Matt's character and he was confronting his father for all the harm that he'd done and pleading with him. And this guy walks up and throws a sandwich at his father. I, I regret inv inviting those people at that pivotal moment. That was a bad play on my part. It is hard to base things on non-human experiences. It is, it's very difficult. We do the best we can. 
Uh, quest for the Book of Dawn, specific lore. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if I have an article on Dear Tarif. I don't know if you want those particular gaps to be painted in or not, but I don't think there's a Dear Tarif article right now, and there might not be a Court of Stars article. Um, and there's probably some other things from that area and that era that are optional. Alaka, uh, the River Dwarves, good work. There, I don't know if there's an article about the magical kingdom of Cryus at the moment. There might not even be an article. There's a, definitely an article about Galadron, and maybe there's an article about Versinget. Yeah, like, Dear Truth just seems to be the one that would make the most sense. But again, I don't know if you want... I don't know if you want all those answers locked in stone or not. Two NPCs with... Draconic names with significant meanings. Well, Miric. Miric's name means song in Draconic. <clears throat> Who's the other? I use Draconic a lot. Like Kepesk, I think, means storm, but Kepesk is a dragonborn, so, you know, there's that. Who else? I don't think Renobi's name is Draconic. It might have been, it might have just been Merrick and Kepesk. So the original plan was for us to wrap and go to break right about now, uh, and then come back with Coriander Society. But, doo -doo -doo. actually, yeah, that is still the plan. So we're going to go ahead and do that now, folks. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with me. I'm going to shut down the stream, and yeah, Renobi doesn't mean anything in Draconic. Uh, I am going to shut down the stream, uh, go to break, and get my cast in gear, and move this cat off my mouse pad, and we're going to play some D&D. But this is your last chance, your last chance if you want to win a copy of Amazing Adventures 5e, do exclamation point, uh, exclamation point Zorbius in chat. Because I'm going to do this giveaway halfway during the break. So, yeah, thanks everyone for hanging out. When I return from this break, Coriander Society will, you know, do its thing and its stuff. <laughs>